started Make Life Fun podcast because I needed more fun in my life. When I became a mother, I, for some reason, just put on this like high ponytail, mom jeans, and nose to the ground. I wasn't having fun. It wasn't until I started having fun that it started becoming easy. Fun and mental health go hand in hand for me. I've been in this mental health game my whole life. <laughs> and I am so lit up to like help other people. I'm so lit up for other people to experience this because it's what my wish and my mission is for every woman is to find safety within themselves because it took me a long time to get here. Our guest today is Alana Gentry, AKA Alana Banana. She is a mom, wife, and podcaster and kid content creator. Her podcast is called Inspired Grownups. Today, we are delving into the reality of infertility and the quest to becoming a mother at any cost, any means necessary. Alana, I am so happy you are here. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Yes. Please tell us about you. Well, I am, yes, everyone calls me Alana Banana. I grew up in Los Angeles. So most people say Alana. My parents are from Texas originally, although they lived in California for 50 years and then recently moved back to retire. So I was always known as Alana Banana, just so people got the pronunciation right. Although it doesn't bother me when people say Alana at all. Yeah, I grew up in Los Angeles as a performer. I was dancing at a young age, always loved to sing, doing acting stuff, and continued with music through my 20s. But it wasn't until my 30s that I just shifted my focus. I always have loved music, but wanted to move into working with kids. Children are so inspiring to me. I think it's really started with my brother. My mom had my brother when she was 41. He was a surprise. So he's 10 years younger than me. I was always the baby until he showed up. (laughs) And when he came along, I was mini mom. I was 10 years old. I was obsessed with him. I loved helping out. And I feel like that is where the seed was planted as far as me wanting to be a mom. He now is one of my best friends. It took, it took a while. I I moved out when I was 18. So for the first eight years of his life, we were super close. I was like a second mom. And then, you know, I was a teenager, did my thing. (laughs) And then once he became an adult, we came back together. And now he's one of my best friends. All my friends started having kids in my thirties and I always knew I wanted to be an older mother. Maybe it was just an intuition Mm -hmm. an instinct thing that I felt like, Oh, it's not going to happen for me until I'm older. And looking back, I think maybe that's because my mom had my brother when she was 41. Mm -hmm. I never even thought about, Oh, as you get older in your thirties, your fertility might not be as, uh, as great as it was, it didn't even cross my mind. I just thought, oh yeah, I'm going to have a kid in my late thirties, maybe 40. And so I just lived my life and was playing music and helping my friends with their kids and then started teaching parent in me classes. I never went to school to become a preschool teacher, but a friend of mine started a company and wanted me to be a part of it because I was playing music for kids Mm -hmm. at that time and switched over to Alana Banana instead of Alana <laughs> Gentry, which is my given last name, Gentry. And it just was the natural progression. Since everyone called me Alana Banana, I started doing children's music. I'm like, oh, I'll be a, the Alana Banana band. And then it turned into the Alana Banana show. But yeah. I love all that. And I can relate on so many things that you just said. I'm the oldest of five. And I felt like I basically was a second mother to my siblings as well. And I think that was the reason why I waited to have kids because I was like, I kind of, I've done this already. So there was a part of me that was, it wasn't conscious. It was subconscious that waited as well to have my first son now that I'm 30. I just turned 34 actually last week. Oh, you're still young. You're still young. (laughs) <laughs> and so, yeah, so I could totally relate to that. And being the oldest too, me and my youngest brother, it's not just until like now that we're starting to like be able to relate because we're so like the age gap, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now my brother, he's in Seattle and I'm in LA, but he has a four-year-old and a one-year-old. And mm. since I have a 13 month old at home, we totally relate on that <laughs> yes. as well. I have an older sister too, but she, her kids are teenagers and mm. adults now. <laughs> So, but as far as working with kids, I just love being around their energy. Mm -hmm. 
in my early twenties, I started getting into yoga because I grew up dancing and I just wanted to stay flexible. So for, it was a, initially a physical choice of just getting into yoga. As I got more into the practice, I got more into the spiritual side of yoga mm. and meditation and started diving into personal development. And I feel like working with kids really helps you stay present yes. because they are so present. They're mm. just, they're just in the moment. And it's my favorite thing. One of my favorite things about mm -hmm. them is just watching them be so present. And so that it reminds me to be present. Mm -hmm. And that has helped me in the last, well, I'm 46 now. So that has helped me tremendously in the last 15 years of hanging out with kids as my job to just be in the flow. I think it's kept me really young because even though I'm 46, I feel really young. I just want to say I feel really like young. I'm, Oh, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> you know, you hear your parents or I heard my parents say like, I can't believe I'm this age. Even now they're in their seventies. I'm like, I don't feel like I'm in my seventies and I'm starting <laughs> to get it. You know, as a child, I had this, I think we all do. We put a stigma on what it is to be 40 or mm. 45 or what is it going to be like at that time? And now that I'm here, I'm like, oh, it's really not that different. I'm, <laughs> I feel wiser. I guess I have had more experiences, mm -hmm. but I still feel super playful and excited for life and what's to come next and what can I learn? And I don't know if that's just my personality or if that is because I am surrounded by children, especially mm -hmm. young children, toddler, babies, toddlers. That's my jam. <laughs> babies and toddlers. <laughs> Yeah. Being around kids, I completely agree with you. Like it brings you to the present moment because that's all they know. They don't know yesterday, tomorrow. It's like right now I'm hungry yeah. right now. I'm tired right now. Like I yes. want to play right now. Like it's just so beautiful that you say that they're so inspiring to you because I feel the same way and even not young, young children. But when I was teaching at the Aveda Institute as a cosmetology instructor, it was the same way being around that creative young minds of creating things and learning things. And because of them, I was so inspired by them going for their dreams that I was like, why don't I make one of my dreams come true? And I actually went traveling for five months solo around Southeast Asia, which would have never happened if I wasn't around that energy of like, create your dreams. Like you're, you're the master of your dreams and you get to create them. And so I love that you're saying that kids have keeping kept you young, kept you inspired and motivated. So I just got chills when you said I traveled through Southeast Asia for five <laughs> months alone. Oh my goodness. I'm somebody that loves travel. My husband and I, obviously before children, traveled a lot. I backpacked through Europe at 19 with a best friend of mine. And that got that gave me the travel bug. We went for six weeks. But doing it solo is a whole other thing. I, that's brave. That's very brave. It was life-giving. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. Amazing. So how is travel for you now with a child? Because for me, Ooh. it's kind of non-existent. <laughs> yes. Well, I did take our girl on one trip on the airplane, actually, to visit my parents in Texas in June. And I was nervous, but she's pretty easygoing. Mm -hmm. So that helps. She was eight months. Okay. So I feel like that's kind of a sweet spot before they get mobile. <laughs> <laughs> she did great. Um, you know, she's very social. So we just like to see everybody. It's a little challenging on the flight because of, I think, COVID restrictions. My sister was across the aisle and they wouldn't let me, they wouldn't let me pass her to her. Interesting. It was, it was weird. I don't know. Maybe it was just the airline. Otherwise it, it was well. Now I'm a little nervous because she's almost walking and yeah, I'm, I'm taking a little break from that, but we've done short trips, like two hour drives and that mm -hmm. we just do during nap time. Mm -hmm. We just put her in the car during nap time. We kind of swing it like that. But I do think it's important to travel with your children. I have a friend named Carolyn who will be on my podcast later. Maybe you should check her out too. She has a, mm -hmm. her Instagram is no back home and she is all about traveling with your child. She's traveled the world with her child who is now 11 years old. She's definitely an advocate for traveling. And I've asked her, well, we haven't had our conversation yet for the show, but I've asked her, well, I don't know if I should go. We might, there's a chance we might go to Hawaii next June. She said, I think you should just go. You just have to know that when you're on a flight with a child, you're not going to be sleeping or reading a book. You're going to be chasing your kid around an airplane, but the more it. you do it. Yeah. But the more you do it, the more they get used to it. Mm -hmm. It's like anything. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you're just broadening their horizons so much. 
That's the dream. So yes. talk more to me about the spirituality and motherhood and how that plays a role for you. I have had challenges with fertility, with becoming a mom. So I didn't get married until I was 36, but I married one of my best friends. Mm -hmm. We met in our early 20s. We were in a band together. We were just bandmates, friends for about seven years before we became a couple. We just wanted to live and travel mm -hmm. before we had a child. So we got married at 36. And after that, I just kind of put it in God's hands, put it in the universe's hands, whatever that is for you. For me, I just surrendered it, said, all right, I'm going to bring this child in whenever it's meant to be. And after about two years, I started thinking, hmm, well, this isn't happening yet. So I guess I should go see if something's going on. So I grew up, my mom is very much into holistic healing and holistic health. She definitely took us to the doctor and it wasn't like she didn't do any Western medicine, but she would, if we got sick, she had her homeopathic, she had her herbs, all of that. I didn't grow up thinking, oh, I want to have fertility treatments. I really was thinking to myself, I hope that I don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. And I know it's a choice. It's obviously always a choice, but I decided after talking to some friends and I had also been doing acupuncture and taking some herbs for about six months and nothing was happening with that. Although I love acupuncture mm -hmm. and I think if anything, it's a stress reduction, it helps you feel better. We went to the doctor and unfortunately, maybe I guess it's how you view it, but so many statistics go into the Western medicine fertility journey. And it was really disheartening when they're saying, oh, at 37, your fertility just drops. And at this time I'm 38, they want us to go to IVF right away. And it's so expensive. I said, no, let's try IUI. So that is insemination. They basically track when you're ovulating. Most of the time they'll give you some sort of medication to help stimulate your ovulation. Then when they know you're ovulating, they take a sample from the male and they'll spin it. They'll spin the sperm to get the best quality. It's, it's kind of mind blowing what it they is. can do with science these days. And then when you're ovulating, you go in and they'll insert it, the sperm, the best sperm close to where the egg would be. Mm -hmm. We ended up doing three rounds of that. And that is not that expensive. Some insurance will cover it. Some don't, but otherwise this was, I don't know how many years ago, seven years ago, it, it tends to run around $1,200, all of that, which isn't crazy compared mm -hmm. to IVF. We tried three rounds of that and none of them were successful. Mm -hmm. And of course, each time it's disheartening. And it, after each time I would take a break, just get back to acupuncture, clean eating, meditating, praying, <laughs> all of the things. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I was 41 that I said to myself, okay, if I don't try IVF, then I'm always going to wonder, is that, will that be the thing that will bring our child in? And although it was very expensive, we were very lucky to have help from family and friends, which was a hard piece for me to receive in that way. And I think that was actually one of the biggest lessons I got from doing IVF was letting people help me. I'm going to get emotional, but mm -hmm. letting people help me because I'm somebody that just wants to do everything on my own and take care of it. To be open to receiving in that way was huge. Looking back, I think that was one of the biggest lessons for me. So we did a round of IVF that is more intensive, more stronger medication. You're giving yourself shots. You're going to the doctor every couple of days for an ultrasound, blood work. It's a lot of poking and prodding. Of course, the hormones go along with that as well, because you're giving yourself these synthetic, actually, it makes your brain think it's producing more estrogen. Mm -hmm. So I was doing acupuncture along with it because I had heard from my acupuncturist and from other people that that would help balance my hormones, but it was still an emotional time. You know, your body's changing, you're feeling bloated, you're emotional. You're really a lot's on the line because a lot of money is on the line. And of course I didn't want to let the people down mm. that invested in this for me. And because I was 41, here's an example. One of my best friends from high school had some issues, fertility issues. She did IVF at 36 and gathered 17 follicles, 17 eggs. But for me at 41, they only got six. Oh gosh. 
and you're like, okay, I guess it is true. <laughs> you know, you're not going to be producing as much. Again, they spin the sperm, they get the best ones and they see after five days, if an embryo has formed, sometimes it works out and there's great em- that look good. And sometimes there aren't. So out of those six, you might get two mm. that looks good, which was our situation. So our doctor said, well, I don't want to just two is not a great ratio. You know, we don't know if they're even genetically Mm. good. So let's do another round, which I was like, oh, Mm. let's do another one and get, try to gather as many embryos. We were grateful that he did help out with some cost things. And there are things you can apply for to get help financially, which we did long story short, we ended up doing three rounds. And only ended up getting three viable embryos out of the whole three rounds. rounds. Yeah. One of them, we didn't get any, which was really upsetting. After the three rounds, we got three viable embryos. And since we had already invested, we said, let's just do the genetic testing. Again, that's another cost, but we're like, we're in it. Let's just do it to make sure. Because a lot of times if you don't test them and you transfer them, if they're not good, then you just will have a a miscarriage, which is, Mm. I think why a lot of miscarriages happen anyway, because it's not a viable embryo. It's kind of protecting you and the baby. So we did that. Now, my husband at the time, he still does works as a musician and does weddings and corporate events. Mm. So he had a wedding booked in Hawaii. And that's one reason we love Hawaii. We get to go often because of his work. (laughs) I said, you know what? I'm just going to go with him. We don't know if this will be our last trip without a child. Or if we find out that the embryos aren't viable, then it'll be a healing trip for me. So that's what happened. The day before we left for Maui, I got a call from our doctor that none of the embryos were viable to transfer. And uh, it just, you can imagine the disappointment. Mm -hmm. It was a very hard day for me. I was at, I got the call when I was actually babysitting my friend's children. Mm -hmm. So I was at the park with a five-year-old and a two-year-old and I'm trying to keep it together, put my sunglasses on. (laughs) But the saving grace was this Maui trip that happened the next day. I just got on the flight. Thank God nobody was sitting next to me. I just let myself cry. And it was the most healing trip I'd ever experienced. When you land in some place so beautiful, there's a shift in perspective, or there was at least for me, mm-hmm. even though I knew I had to grieve what was happening. It's also, I got into the ocean and I'm crying and I'm asking this ocean to just heal me, the salt water to just take away my pain. And it's so hard to be sad when you're immersed in such beauty. So I highly recommend yeah. if anybody has something really upsetting that happens to them, if they're able to even you know, you don't have to go to Hawaii, but go somewhere that's so beautiful. I feel like in nature for me anyway, that nature is church for me. Mm -hmm. My yoga practice is church for me. Nature is that for me as well. It was a very healing experience Mm -hmm. to be in the water every day, to be surrounded by the mountains and the energy of of Hawaii, that aloha energy Mm -hmm. people talk about. I just got a really great perspective. I I said, okay, maybe this isn't, this isn't the way for us then. And that's when I realized that I think one of the biggest lessons for me in IVF was the lesson of receiving, letting people help me. So we got home and we just put it on the back burner. I said, let's, it's too much. Let's just live our life. Let's not think about trying to have a baby. Maybe I'm just supposed to be surrounded by kids that I work with. At this point, I'm teaching toddler, baby, toddler music classes in Los Angeles. I'm around pregnant mamas all the time. I'm around hundreds of kids a week. I have a godmother to six children. So I'm like, this is, this might be it for us. <laughs> and I got okay with that for about a year, a couple of years. And then I decided to do a silent retreat. It was something I'd always wanted to do. A friend suggested a place down in San Diego in California. And I've never done anything like that before, but I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to go for two days. Mm-hmm. Let's see what that's about. Let's see what it's like to be quiet for two days and not look at my phone, not check email. And again, another great, amazing thing for me. I was writing a lot. I was meditating a lot, praying, reading spiritual text, and just kept coming through. You're meant to be a mother. You're meant to be a mother. You're meant to be a mother. I'm like, okay, then show me the way. (laughs) Show me. How can I heal this? Backtracking a little bit. The year before, I did get into a support program. 
of this woman who helps with fertility. Her name's Molly Nichols. I met her online. She's amazing. Mm -hmm. She works with journaling, visualization. She gets to the bottom of what emotionally are you holding back with as far as becoming a mama? Mm -hmm. And even though I didn't get pregnant after doing this program, it was therapy for me. I feel like I uncovered a lot of things. I want a career, but I want to be a mama. Can I do both? I grew up with a stay-at-home mom. So that was something subconsciously that I thought I wanted to do. Skip to the silent retreat. It's coming in. You're meant to be a mom. You're meant to be a mom. And I'm just like, show me the way. Okay. So yes. So when I got home, I would listen to a podcast and someone would be talking about adoption. I would get a book from the library. I love reading memoirs. I love hearing people's stories, which is another reason why I'm excited about having my own podcast is to hear people's stories. I feel like I get so much from that. Mm -hmm. But all these signs kept coming in about adoption, adoption. And my husband and I had talked about it before, but we weren't ready to step into that yet. So I brought it up to him a few months later. I said, look, this happened on my retreat. And I've been hearing this word, you know, adoption has been coming up and he goes, me too. Oh my gosh, me too. And we just hadn't talked about it. Oh my gosh. And so we're crying. We're like, oh my gosh. Okay. Are we going to do this? Let's do this. Let's, let's do this. So we, again, then we're faced with, do we do private adoption or do we do foster to adopt? I had known through my music classes, a couple of parents who have fostered to adopt, but I didn't know them well. So I didn't know their stories. So I just started asking around, like, can you tell me more about your experience? And one mom said, if you're going to foster to adopt, you really need to go into it knowing that it's fostering and that reunification with the bio family is the goal. So I said, okay, am I ready for that? Can I Uh hold that? Can I handle that? And somebody I met connected me with a man who had worked at a private agency. So he knew that world, but then he fostered and ended up adopting siblings. I'm like, that's who I want to talk to. Somebody who has done both. Now, private adoption is very expensive. Again, it can be 30 to $50,000. And that's all legal fees and agency fees and things like that, which was like, oh, are we going to try to get that money together? Or are we going to do the fostering route? The man I talked to was very much an advocate for fostering for so many reasons, especially in Los Angeles. I don't know what it's, I'm sure every state is different, but there are about 20, 25,000 children who need homes. One of my concerns was, of course, every child in the foster system is coming from trauma. That's a whole other piece of the puzzle. I was thinking, well, if a private adoption, are they going to have as many issues? And I hate to say it, but that was yes. something that came into my mind. The way he looked at it was like, yes, most likely, you know, a lot of times they are still coming from hard backgrounds, maybe substance abuse, but the biological mother knows enough that she's not ready for this. And she wants to find specifically the mother or the family, you know, father, whoever Mm -hmm. to take this child for her in the foster system. You also get help from the state. You get money each month to help there on Medi-Cal or in California, their insurance is taken care of for the whole 18 years. If they need any kind of therapy that is provided for them. Mm -hmm. And then you have the support system from the foster agency. Now, some people don't go through a foster agency. Some people go through in California, DCFS, Department of Children and Family Services. I think every state has mm-hmm. one. I personally think it's better to go through a foster agency because you do have a support system there. Our agency has support groups. There's just a lot of ways that you can find support, which is you don't necessarily get when you're going just from the county So his suggestion was go to a couple of different foster agencies. Everyone has their own vibe and their own feel and see if it's something that resonates with you. So I thought that's a good plan. Then I'll, I'll have a better idea of what we want to do. Now, in the meantime, through meditations and working with that class that I did before journaling meditation, I always had rainbows would come up and feathers of like, my child is out there. The spirit of my baby is waiting for me. So I would find, you know, my walk feathers or see rainbows. And those were just little signs Mm -hmm. that I thought, okay, it's still happening for me. The first time we walked into a foster agency orientation, they had rainbows everywhere, (laughs) all over the room. (laughs) And I started crying and I'm like, okay, this is where we need to be. It just gave me chills. Yeah. This is where we need to be. It wasn't that foster agency we went 
towards, although they were great. But the next one we went to, there was just something. The woman who trains people, the woman who takes the calls and takes calls, I just in, immediately felt a connection with. And all the people that were there for the orientation, it just felt right. So we went with them. They're called Five Acres in Los Angeles. And we decided to go for it. So this is the beginning of 2020 before COVID. Mm -hmm. We do our in-person training. We got all of our in-person training done before COVID and then COVID hit and we finished everything online. And it's definitely when you get into fostering, I think private adoption fostering, you just have to know they're going to find out everything about your life. (laughs) You just have to be willing to share everything. Yeah. Open book, which I understand. We went through the training and we did shift our perspective. Okay. In the training, you do learn a lot about bio families. Why are, why are these kids in foster care? There's so many reasons looking at it from the biological mother's perspective. What must that be like for them? So it's really a shift in perspective. Like, okay, it's going to be hard, but if I can keep that focus of just being a support to this child and to the bio family, then I think I should be good. Mm. <laughs> Somebody in training said, well, aren't you going to, are we going to get attached? I mean, how can you not get attached? And the woman who trained us said, that's your job. If you don't get attached, you're not doing your job. You shouldn't be doing it. You're here to show this child attachment. That's what do you choose? Answer, yeah. Yeah. So we started, we got certified at the summer 2020. A month later, we got our first intake call. Oh, wow. And we took in a newborn 10, 10 day old baby boy. Wow. Yeah. And had him for three months. Of course, since it was our first child and I'd been wanting a baby for so long, I was hoping it was forever, but he ended up moving on to the home where his brother was at, which I knew was the right thing for both of them. So they could bond. And just last week they reunited with their mom, their bio mom. She did everything she needed to do. She worked really hard. Once you meet them, I think every situation is different, Mm -hmm. but once you meet for me, when I met his bio, biological, his birth mother, I should say, I liked her and I knew she was trying. And so that made me want to support her and helped me. Of course I did get attached, mm-hmm. but it helped me step back and say, what's best for this child. It's best for him to be with his mom. If she is healthy enough to have him and she worked really hard at doing that. So it was a celebration for everybody. Mm-hmm. But that week after he left, I was a puddle of tears, as you can imagine. We took a three week break. It was around the holidays. I went to visit my sister and I drove out to Texas to visit our family. That was nice too, having a break. And we got a call from our agency right after Christmas. And she said, no pressure. I know you need a time, but I'm just letting you know there's a real need. And I'm getting tons of calls for babies. Another thing you can say what age range Mm -hmm. you wanted because I've always worked with babies and toddlers and I know how important the first three years of a child's life are in their development. I, that was what resonated with me. I wanted to be a part of that for a child. Plus we have small dogs and I knew one of our dogs wouldn't love a running toddler in our house right away. Yes. (laughs) Yes. I felt, I honestly, I felt a little guilty about wanting a baby because I know there's so many older children. You hear the stories of the older children that need families, but in our agency, she said, don't, don't feel guilty. I get calls for newborns all the time. They need a family just as mm-hmm. much. And there are families that want a school age child so they can keep their job and their, the child can go to school. So I had to let that go. Mm-hmm. Three weeks later, the, the day after I got back from my trip, January 7th, We got a call at three in the afternoon for a three month old baby girl. So she was Mm. the age that our first foster baby left us three months. They tell you very little. So much of the information is confidential. It's like an onion. You learn more, the layers come off. You learn more as you go along, but the DCFS can only share a certain amount of information with you about why they're removed, Mm. background of the family, et cetera. So the little information they told us we just initially said, yes, yes. And so four hours later, she showed up at our door, all smiles too, Mm. just like talking to us, gurgling, smiling. It's been amazing. It's been amazing. It's been 10 months now that she's been with us. 
I don't know what the future holds. We see we have a relationship with her mom and we have a good relationship. No matter what, I want to keep that, whether we adopt her or she reunites, because if she reunites, we want to be in her life. We want to be aunt and uncle to her. If we adopt, if her mom is healthy, we want her to know who her birth mom is because we're learning that is going to be better for her. We don't want her to be a teenager and resent us. So we know there's a lot of counseling we're going to need around that as we go. But right now we're just taking it one day at a time. Just enjoying it. Oh, that story. I had goosebumps from head to toe so many times, so many times. I think you're such a strong and brave woman to be able to do all that and go through that journey. Cause I know that wasn't easy. Well, I think back to your initial question after my long, long story, No, that story needed to be told for me, my faith is what has pulled me through. I guess I grew up in a Christian household, but I don't consider myself one particular religion. I did go to Christian schools, but in my twenties, thirties, I really did a lot of self-discovery and I do have a relationship with God, but I wouldn't say I'm one particular religion. I think I'm more spiritual. I give thanks every day, Mm -hmm. but if I didn't have that connection for myself with something greater than myself, I don't know if I would have been able to navigate it as well continually still, because some days I'm in a great state of mind and really present with it. And then some days, you know, just last week, we had a support group session with our agency and hearing stories of people who have been with a child for two years. And even though the county social worker and the attorney didn't think they should reunite, it's all up to the judge and the judge reunited them and having to just surrender that and say, okay, well, all I can do is what I did for two years for this child. Now it's out of my hands. And I cried so much that night in fear of what's going to happen to us. But then I had to check myself and say, that is happening in that may or may not happen like anything Mm -hmm. in life. It may or may not happen. So all we have is this moment. So how can I bring joy into this moment? How can I have fun in this moment? And that's where my faith helps me. And uh, yeah, I wouldn't be where I'm at without it. Yeah, me too. Me too. I'm right there with you. I was actually in foster care from really? seventh grade, mm-hmm, from seventh grade until I graduated a year early from high school. Oh my goodness. You're just now telling me. <laughs> wow. Are you going to talk about that on your show? Oh, yes. Okay, good. I would, yeah. I can't wait to hear that story. So, oh my goodness. It is dear to my heart. And I know it takes a strong, strong person to be able to take that on. And even though you said there's help out there and you have that support system at the end of the day, you, you are the one doing the heavy lifting. So that's why I wanted yes. to give so much props to you. Oh, that's thank beautiful. you. Heavy lifting, yes, waking up in the night and all those things. But also part of me feels a little bad for her birth mama in this, but I also get to see a lot of her firsts, you know, her first steps. Although I do share them with her birth Mm -hmm. mom, you know, I send her pictures all the time and grandma, grandma's definitely very much a part of, of this too, as well. We see each other once a week. We do a zoom call once a week. I share pictures, I'm very open about where she's at. And it's so fun being able to experience things again for the first time. (laughs) And I'm really excited for the holidays too, Christmas trees and all of it and sharing music with her. I mean, music is my love and I get to, she loves music and I grew up dancing. She loves dance. Who knows (laughs) if it's, if she'll do that as she's older, but I think she'll have an appreciation for it. So you're introducing her to it. That's so great. I want to go back to what you said about Being able to receive was one of the biggest lessons you learned through your process of receiving help with your IVF treatment. And I know as a woman, I think that is a lot of our thing is that it's hard to receive it. Like we can give it all day long. The moment it comes for us to open up our palms and be like, thank you. It becomes like heavy for us. So how did you allow yourself to open up to receive? Because I think that is a huge, like once you get that mind shift of opening to receive, like life just gives you what you need because you're not scared to ask for it. Yes. And even though mentally I knew, you know, I'd done a lot of work on myself prior to this and I knew it's a cycle. You give, you receive, you give, you receive. But as somebody who just 
likes to do things on their own. <laughs> I thought, you know, of course I give birthday gifts. I treat somebody for dinner, like little things, not thousands of dollars worth of things. Although if I had thousands of dollars to give to somebody, I would for those things. So I, I was thinking to myself, well, why wouldn't I let somebody who has that give that back to me? It really was started with my oldest friend. We met when we were five. We were like inseparable through elementary school. She's now more like a sister and came into a lot of money as she was older of family. She got this inheritance. We were driving and I, I shared with her, you know, obviously along the way, everything that I was going through, she sat me down actually this is before we were, I was driving, but she sat me down and said, I want to help you with this. And we had some saved too. So it wasn't like yeah. all of it. I want, I want to help you with this. And I'm, at first I said, the only way I will let you help me is if you let me pay you back in payments. And at the moment, in the moment she said, okay, okay, that's fine. So I felt okay with that. I didn't want her to think we were taking advantage of her situation. It made me feel okay to say, I can pay you back a monthly thing. And then driving in the car one day, she called me. She had already given us some and another great friend and family. Everyone kind of came together for us. And with the family at this point, because my first friend, Ashley, had given us this chunk, I that helped me open a little bit because the other people that came forward, I knew where their heart was at. And I knew that they were like family and I had to just get out of my own way. And they were all telling me, get out of your own way. This makes me happy. Let me do this for you. And I think when someone says that to you, you really have to listen because I... I was thinking, you're right. If I had this, if I were in your shoes and I could provide this for you and I know how important it is for you to have a baby, I would do that. So I really had to, that was a shift. I had to mm -hmm. put myself in their shoes and think I would do it too. So what's my problem? Like mm -hmm. get out of your own way. Maybe it's subconscious. I think a lot of it was yeah. just subconscious old childhood beliefs of not having en enough. You know, my parents weren't, we were middle-class, but there were times my dad lost his company at one point, you know, there were times where we didn't have a lot. And so it was like, money doesn't grow on trees, all those things, you know, you have to work really hard. And those are deep rooted belief systems mm -hmm. that I was working on excavating and letting go of to bring in more abundance into my mm -hmm. life. And so then I'm doing the work this abundance comes in my life. What am I going to do? Am I going to say, no, no, no. I asked for it and it shows up and I'm going to say, no, I had to check myself. Say, that's ridiculous, Alana. That's ridiculous. Receive, receive. Even though it was so uncomfortable, I just said, okay. So when my friend called me and said, I know you want to pay me back. I'm not letting you pay me back. And I had to pull my car over and just cry and cry and cry. <laughs> I just had to say, okay, thank you. Thank you. And in my heart of hearts, I'm thinking, oh, I hope I can give her a trip somewhere someday, or I hope I can <laughs> return it in some way. But I also just had to know that it felt so good for her to give and put myself in her shoes. So I think even if you feel uncomfortable, that's something I've been working with you. You're doing the work on yourself. Something shows up that you want. It's uncomfortable to step into, but you don't grow if you don't step into it. So yeah. So letting go of that uncomfortable feeling of receiving and being like, okay, I'm going to accept it. And it, sometimes it does. It makes you cry to receive. It does. Yes, it does. I've got, I've definitely gotten better about it from that situation. And, and because I've been able to give more as I've mm -hmm. gotten older and, you know, cultivated more in my life and that feels so good. So mm -hmm. I just, yeah. Yeah. And that's what you do when you receive, you open up to be able to give as well, because it can't just be yes. one way. It has to be a give and receive type of thing. So I'm so glad that you were able to talk to us about that, because I think that's so huge for women. That's so huge. Yes. I think that's one of one of the biggest things is being open to receive, whether it is love, whether it is for you, like money, being able to receive like the kindness of a stranger, just even saying you're beautiful, like yes. your outfit is cute. Like even that, sometimes you're just like, ooh, this old thing. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. Just... Or even now with our chat, with our little girl at home, even my husband saying, let me just take her for a little longer. Like, so you can do some work mm -hmm. or, and sometimes because I love being a mama, I'm like, oh, I'll do it. I'll do it. Or let me get up with her in the night. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, receive it. Let him yes, do it. Yes, <laughs> exactly. It's, yes. it's in all areas when it comes to receiving, we have to be aware of it first. And then say, you know what? It might not be comfortable, but I'm going to do it. 
So yes. I love that we're talking about this and I love that we're talking about fostering into adoption. And I think this conversation is so much needed. Yes, I, I agree. And we would like to adopt. I mean, of course, mm-hmm. after being with our girl for 10 months, we would love to adopt her. Mm-hmm. But if her mom does do the work that she's working on and heals her life and they reunite, we're going to support her in that mm-hmm. as well. Um, and there will be another child mm-hmm. we will take in and take care of. And my husband, Eric, he said the other day, maybe that's just what we are meant to do. Maybe we are just meant to foster and we're going to have a lot of kids in and out of our lives. Who knows? We don't know. So just one day at a time. One day at a time. That's coming back to presence. Like you were saying at the beginning with being around young kids, it brings you to the present moment. And that is something worth cultivating presence. I believe, I believe if we, if we are staying in the present moment as present as we can be, it makes everything just seem a little easier, right? And a little bit more fun because you're not so worried about the past or the future. Totally. And I think it is a daily practice too, because as many years that I've been practicing meditation, mindfulness, I still every day need to, I have tons of little books that have Mm -hmm. great passages or something that helps me be like, no, right now there's so much beauty in the now Mm -hmm. it takes, it does take the pressure off Mm -hmm. of What is one of your practices that you do to stay present? Well, definitely yoga. I mean, my yoga practice has shifted since we have a child in the home. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't go to classes or do really an hour long practice or longer, but if I can get in even 10 minutes, Mm -hmm. 15 minutes, whether that's me waking up before she gets up or during a nap time, or even just when she goes to bed, I have this little room that Mm -hmm. I'm in right now. That's like my little yoga nook. My teacher said, the mind follows the breath. And it's so true. So t- doing conscious breathing, stretching, and I also love taking walks. I feel like I get a lot of presence when I'm walking, whether it's with our girl or our dogs, just looking at nature and saying, this is what's in front of me right now. So those are practices for me. Yeah. That help me. Beautiful practices. And I agree with you with the breath. If it takes one breath, if you would just notice one breath, that is enough mm-hmm. to bring you back to this moment. Yeah. And I think it goes, it's throughout the day. I mean, you're never going to be present all day, every day, yes. except for maybe Eckhart Tolle, you yes. can do that, but, but <laughs> that's what we're working towards, mm-hmm. but it's like, okay, can I be present for this for a little bit? And then you find your mind drifting and then you're aware of that. So then you're like, okay, can I come mm-hmm. back? Can to the I present? come back? Yes. Yeah. And that breath being that focal point, I think is, yeah, like you said, a beautiful thing. One of my favorite practices for remaining presence. I learned this last year. I don't know where, but I learned this. Like if, when you have a candle lit in front of you, like being present with the candle and then being present with yourself and then being yes. with the candle and being with yourself. I was like, this practice is the coolest thing. Cause I'm a big fan of candles and they're always Me too. all over the house. And Me so- too. I actually learned to make them last year. So I make my own candles. I'm not for sale, just like for myself. Yes. And I always light one when I meditate or do yoga. Mm-hmm. Same thing. I love it. Yes. Yeah. I want to learn how to make candles. That's, that's- so easy. Is it's it so really? easy. Yes. You just go, Amazon has like a little candle kit, you know, and then you buy the wax separately uh-huh. and the jars separately. But once you have the little kit, That's it's it? so easy. <gasps> yeah. Well, yeah. you just saved me a few hundred dollars in candle yeah. buying, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that with us. And thank you for totally. being here today and sharing your story. I, I am so thankful. Oh, thank you. It's been really great talking with you. Yay. I really loved it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to the Make Life Fun podcast. I am so filled with joy to have you here. If this show resonates with you, I have a gift for you. If you're feeling stuck, this freebie may be just what you need. I believe that if you know your why, it helps you get unstuck quicker. So to connect with your heart and know your why and figure out what it is that is most important to you, get the freebie. It's in the show notes. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast to get notifications each week. To support the show, you're invited to leave a tip in the tip jar. Information for all this is in the show notes. Sending love and light to the spirit listening to this today. Be blessed.